Oxalates are popping up on my radar more and more, and one of the most egregious accusations is that these plant-dwelling molecules cause cancer. So the implication has been that eating more plants that contain large amounts of oxalates increases our risk of cancer. Well, there are a number of ways that we can probe that question. Do oxalates cause cancer? If we were to ask these researchers, I think the title speaks for itself. And after cracking open this study, I, it certainly has some scary data. So let's scare ourselves. Let's keep it PG. Uh, poopless. So we know that oxalates are predominantly found in plant foods, especially spinach, soy, sweet potatoes, and several more. There are a number of hypotheses as to why they exist, one of which being related to plant defense. I'm not a botanist, so I have absolutely zero clue if there's any truth to that claim. But in the end, it's all beside the point because what we really care about is how it affects us. So the researchers of this study performed a number of experiments. For one, they injected mice in the breast tissue with one of three substances. One, oxalates. Two, saline, known as the control. And three, acetic acid, another control, because they thought that it might be possible that cancer might arise from a change in pH. That part isn't really that important right now. Let's focus on the data from the oxalate injection and the control injection. What we're looking at here is a survival curve, also known as a Kaplan-Meier. The vertical axis is the percent of mice alive. So the top is 100% of mice that are still alive. And the horizontal axis is the number of days that the mice were alive. So notice the jumps in time. It isn't linear. The red arrows are the times that the mice were injected with their respective solution. So that's oxalates or control. And the acetic acid is the third less important condition. The pink arrow is when the first tumor was noticed on the mice. The blue arrow is when all the mice in a condition had at least one tumor. The green line is the oxalate condition. And the red is the control condition. What do we see? Remember, we're looking at survival. Well, by day 75 of oxalate injection, all the oxalate injected mice had a cancerous tumor. And by day 86 or so, they were all dead. Pretty striking results when you also consider that the two control conditions lived long lives well into the 200s of days, which is a long time for mice. It's certainly tough to see data like that and not raise an eyebrow, even in mice. The next piece of data showed the amount of oxalates found in the tumor itself. So if you were to take out the tumor and measure the amount of oxalate molecules inside, what do you find? According to this data, where we see a comparison of normal mouse breast tissue on the left, and the cancerous breast tissue on the right in black, there is a clear difference in the amount of oxalates stored. But that's in the mouse. Does this also bear out in humans? For that, we can simply move the mouse data aside and put the human data side by side. And the answer is clear. Human breast cancer also contains higher concentrations of oxalates. But Keep in mind that this data doesn't speak to exposure to oxalates. It only speaks to the amount of oxalates present in the tissue because we don't know if these people with breast cancer were exposed to more oxalates than normal. It's entirely possible that cancer cells specifically produce or take up more oxalates from the cellular environment, even if the whole body oxalate levels are within normal ranges of exposure. Still, it's not exactly a comforting relationship, especially after seeing the mouse survival data. Okay, so the researchers decided to look into the mechanisms by which oxalates might have these pro-cancerous effects. Up to now, there has been extremely little research on the topic, so the mechanisms have been a mystery. But the researchers did discover one potent one. There's a protein in our cells that is classified as a pro-oncogene. What does that mean? 
It means the gene is related to cellular growth and division and is highly related to cancer. To clarify further, this gene is not present within your cells to cause cancer. It has a normal function of promoting cell division and its overactivity can lead to unregulated cell growth, also known as cancer. So this protein called CFOS will link up with another protein inside your cells called C-June. CFOS and C-June combine, or through some fancy terms, heterodimerize into a complex called AP1. AP1 then binds the genes necessary for cellular division. Again, the overactivity of this AP1 complex can spell cancer. The researchers show, I'll show you some of the images in a minute, that CFOS is highly present when cells are exposed to oxalates. So somehow oxalates activate the proteins responsible for the expression of CFOS gene and thereby leads to large amounts of CFOS protein production, which in turn returns to the nucleus as AP1 and binds genes to promote cell division. We see that evidenced here. The top two panels are CFOS. If you see green, then you see CFOS. The bottom panels are DAPI stains for identifying where DNA is located, otherwise stated where genes are located. So two criteria have to be met. One, there has to be green present, meaning that CFOS is present. And two, it has to overlay where DAPI is present to indicate there is close proximity to the genes of the cell. Where do we see both of those criteria met? On the right side, the tumor cells. There's more evidence presented by the researchers, but I'll leave it for a deeper discussion. Let's return to the more meaningful data. So far, we've seen that oxalates cause tumor formation, that they're found in higher concentrations in tumors, and oxalates induce CFOS expression, which can be a cancer-promoting gene. The researchers also end up showing increased cell division in two human breast cancer lines when these cells are exposed to oxalates directly. So, it seems clear that oxalates cause cancer based on all this data. And the title of the study has certainly accurately tells the full story. But if you've checked the length of this video, you can see we haven't finished this story. There are a few considerations that may begin to turn our perspective, like the slow groan of a sharply turning ship. And yes, there's an iceberg ahead. Let's return to the survival data. No, not that survival data, this survival data. It's read the exact same way as before, but the researchers have added a condition which really begins to put things into a new perspective. We still have the injection of oxalates in the breast tissue of the mice, and we still have the control injection. However, now the researchers have added an injection of the very same oxalates in the back and do you see a blue line descending from the 100% survival mark? I don't. And that's because none of these mice died and none of these mice developed tumors. What? Now we're establishing tissue specificity, meaning that oxalates only negatively affect breast tissue. And this was further evidenced when looking at the cell data which I avoided showing you earlier because it's, well, it's a bit complex, but I suppose it solidifies the point. Here, the researchers are literally just plating cells in a dish and simply exposing the cells to a variety of treatments. I won't go over all of them, but for brevity. So they're measuring the DNA levels as a proxy of cell division. The more DNA, the more cells. At least that's the idea. And that's what we see on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, we see four cell lines. The MCF7 and MDA-MB231 are human breast cancer cells. Please note that in your mind, breast cancer. The MCF10 cells are the normal non-cancerous human breast cells. And the HEC293 cells are cancerous kidney cells. The orange and red bars are the oxalate conditions. So the cells are exposed to oxalates at varying concentrations. The red bar has the most. 
you might be wondering what the green bar is. It's called a positive control and exposes the cells to a serum containing growth factors like FBS and EGF. So, okay, I won't go into the specifics on that because it brings us down a path that we'd have difficulty getting back on track. The, the bottom line is that it's a serum expected to increase cell division. So that all explained, in all conditions, we see elevated levels of cell division with the positive control, the FBS condition, with a greater cell division in all of the cancer lines compared to the normal cells, the MCF10 cells. As expected, and as I mentioned earlier, the oxalate exposure led to greater cell division in both of the breast cancer cell lines, and even an increase in the normal breast cells, but the increase was vastly lower in the normal cells. But the whole reason I showed you this data was to show you the hex cells. Remember, these are kidney cancer cells, and what do oxalates do? Big ol' zilch. This speaks again to the specificity of the oxalate effect. It seems only breast tissue is sensitive. Okay, but there are a few more things that I should point out that will really change the color of the sky. I just made that saying up, but I think it works here. I don't know. What do you think? Maybe it doesn't. The researchers mentioned almost offhandedly that they actually repeated the mouse data in another set of mice. Guess what happened? Seriously. Guess. I'll, I'll wait. You know what happened? Nothing. Oxalates injected in the breast tissue of these other mice had zero impact. No tumors formed, even when they followed up months later, which is years in a mouse's life. So what in the world is going on here? Well, <laughs> all the mouse data from earlier was in Balb C nude mice. Yeah, they look like this. Yeah, ugly little... Nani? Okay, maybe I shouldn't judge. Either way, these mice aren't known for being part of a nudist colony, but rather they lack a thymus, meaning that they are immunodeficient. The other mice were not, and that is likely the massive distinction that leads one group to be susceptible to oxalates and the other not. But let's steer the ship back in the other direction. That still doesn't explain two major things. One, it doesn't explain why human cancer cells exposed to oxalates still divided even more quickly than normal. Additionally, it doesn't explain why oxalates are found in human breast tumors. And I suppose a third is that it doesn't explain the added sensitivity of breast tissue compared to other tissues. I imagine the answer to the first question is because these cells do not have T cells present to protect them. These are immune cells that mature in the thymus and are key immune cells for protecting against cancer. It still means that oxalates may cause a burden and the body relies on T cells to keep cancer at bay. There's no definitive proof of that here, but it opens the possibility. Second, as I mentioned earlier, oxalates can still be related to cancerous tumors without needing to increase the body's exposure. Again, we have no data here to get to the answer of that. Third, there are some unique aspects of breast cells, like their readiness to rapidly multiply if given the right signals. Think of childbirth as one of those potent signals. Again, another one that requires so much more data. But where does that leave us with oxalates? Well, did you know that you produce oxalates? That's right your metabolism produces oxalates across a number of reactions within your cells. Not only that, it's estimated that 50% or more of the oxalates in your body come from your own production. Additionally, cooking food massively reduces the amount of oxalates in your food, and the absorption of oxalates is a more nuanced discussion. So, as it stands, while my eyebrow remains raised... I always have trouble with this. 
I don't see this study as proof that oxalates cause cancer. Maybe in the future we'll get more studies on the matter, but I should also add that at the beginning of this story, I did mention that there are multiple ways of probing this question. We're looking at one study that directly probes the question, but we can also look at people who consume foods with high oxalate content and track if they develop cancer, especially breast cancer at higher levels. I'll be attacking this subject again in the future, but if you wanna know more about this study and oxalates as a whole, I'd highly recommend my detailed analysis releasing right here in two days or some of my other content. And with that, I'll oxy see you later. That was, that was horrid, Nick. Stop. Stop.